We know that languages are made up of signifier-signified relations, and that those signifiers are linear streams of information, most often auditory, but also visual cues or gesture, as is the case of sign languages. Humans tend to separate these streams of information in different ways. Focusing on auditory information, the smallest separation possible is the segment, or sound segment. Any given word will be made up of one or more sound segments. The word sad, for example, consists of three sound segments, s, a, and d. Similarly, glad consists of four sound segments, g, o, a, and d. Sound segments are conventionally surrounded by square brackets in linguistics, thus sad, glad. Separating sound segments can seem quite natural in one's native language, but you may have noticed that if you listen to someone speaking a foreign language, you have trouble differentiating different sounds that they make. People notice this most often with words, but it's true of single sound segments as well, especially if the sound segment someone is producing is not used by your language. More on that in a second. The technical term for a sound segment in this sense is a phone. Every language will have some set of phones which comprise all the sounds a native speaker will produce to pronounce any word in that language. Now one language's set of phones may be different from another language's set. Some languages may have more phones, some may have fewer. This corresponds to the arbitrariness principle of Saussure, it's principle one. So one difficulty in learning a foreign language can be producing phones which you have not produced before. That is, the target language has phones in its set which are not in the set of your native language. A good example of this is American English R versus the Romance Rhotic R. Both of these are R-like sounds, and they're used as R's in their respective languages. But if you can pronounce American English R, it doesn't help you to pronounce R. You have to practice it. Likewise, speakers of languages which use the R often have trouble producing the R sound, because the two are not related. You may have noticed use of special characters to represent these phones. A standard written system of representation is needed if phonetics is going to be able to be useful. Historically, there have been many systems used to represent sounds of languages. Some of those, like those used in the dictionary, may be largely specific to a particular language. Others are designed to have a written symbol to represent every possible human phone. The most common one in use today is known as the International Phonetic Alphabet and that is essentially the tacit standard system used in linguistics. To understand how the phones represented in the IPA are organized, you need to know something about their production. The production of a phone is called articulation, and it involves movement of the vocal apparatus, i.e. the muscles of the mouth, in order to generate a sound which is recognizable as a particular phone by speakers of the language. So when someone mumbles, they can be hard to understand, and this is because they're not fully articulating the phones and those listening cannot recognize the phones as what they are. It's important to remember as you're learning the IPA that some characters will match English letters, some will not, but most will not match the sound that the English letter is thought to produce. This is because the English spelling system is incredibly and very famously inconsistent. A good example of this inconsistency is often attributed to George Bernard Shaw, although he doesn't seem to have come up with it. He attributes it to an anonymous spelling reformer in the 19th century. Look at this sequence of English letters. G, H, O, T, I. How would you pronounce this? Most people would say gotti or goti, perhaps. Already we can see that the O can correspond to either a A or O sound. But it seems like the G and the H and the T and the E or I at the end should be fairly consistent, but in fact they're not. Notice that we have a word enough, E N O U G H, and that G H sound at the end makes an F. We also have the word women, W O M E N, where that O seems to make an I sound. Women. Also, the word nation, N A T I O N, has a SH in the middle represented by a T followed by an I. Thus, G-H-O-T-I could spell fish, because the English spelling system is just that bad. 
Now, back to phonetics. We can describe phones by the muscles and movements required to articulate them. These movements can be quite complex, even though native speakers generally have no issue whatsoever carrying them out. It's essentially second nature. For example, the sound represented by the IPA symbol is articulated by placing the lips together so as to completely block airflow through the mouth, building pressure behind the lips using the pulmonic system, the lungs, and releasing, or opening, the lips. So this is the sound in spat, and it happens to match the English orthography of the letter P. As I mentioned, the aim of the IPA is to have a symbol for every possible human sound. But this table is just for English. As a consequence, let's go over the important parts of the mouth which are used in the articulation of English phones. First, we have the lips, used to produce bilabial sounds. Then we have the teeth, which together with the lips can be used to make labiodental sounds, or with the tongue can be used to make interdental sounds. The alveolar ridge is where sounds like t, d, s, and z are produced. The post-alveolar area gives us things like sh, or zh, or the affricates ch and j. By the way, don't worry about the term affricate. We'll go over that when we go over consonants. Then there's the palate, the velum, and the glottis. Incredibly, this is essentially all the muscular apparatus that is required to produce all the sounds of the English language, be they consonant or vowel, or something in between, of which there are a couple. Now that we've covered the anatomy and the basic concept of a phone, in the next video, I'll go through the English consonants and vowels in detail.